Welcome back. For this set of videos, we're going to be focusing on classroom procedures and how they can help you with classroom management. But first, let's remind ourselves about that definition on classroom management. So creating and maintaining a positive and productive classroom. We've already seen the positive side. Now we're going to be looking at the productive side. How can you keep your class productive? And by that, I mean, how can you increase the time on task and the time spent learning? So let's first get a couple of terms down, and that is the difference between a procedure and a rule. So if we look over here to the left, a procedure. A procedure is how you do your daily work. How do you take attendance? How do you collect homework? What do students need to do to go to the bathroom? Things like that. Rules are a little bit different. Rules are where you clarify what is acceptable and unacceptable in your classroom. Rules have consequences if you break them. Um, and rules specify those critical student behaviors. <clears throat> so right now, we're focusing on procedures. A little bit later, we're going to get to rules. So there are a lot of educational psychologists out there, and I'm one of them, who agree that the key to productivity in your classroom is procedures. So let's first start with a couple of questions like, well, why? Why is this the key to productivity? How is it that they're helpful? Well, first of all, studies have found that students do actually appreciate <clears throat> structure in the classroom and predictability. Predictability is one of the outcomes of having routines or procedures. Uh, it does improve what we call time on task. So time on task is looking at the amount of time in your classroom that is actually spent learning. So obviously, the higher your time on task, the better student learning. Um, I thought this was a nice quote. So this is from Harry Wong. He's a fairly famous educational psychologist that has written a lot of books on classroom management. Student achievement at the end of the year <clears throat> is directly related to the degree to which a teacher establishes good control of classroom procedures the very first week of school. And study after study has shown this to be true. So again, <clears throat> whether they know it or not, students in general do appreciate and do better in classrooms that have structure and productivity. They learn more because there's more time on task. It helps your class to be more organized because procedures help things run more smoothly. They help students know how things are going to get done, and it just makes your class in general <clears throat> better organized. Let's see what else. This is a great one. It lightens your list of responsibilities. You're going to have so many things that you're in charge of in your class. Do you also really need to be responsible for sharpening everyone's pencils? Do you also need to re be responsible for cleaning everyone's desk? Having good classroom procedures can lighten your load by giving more responsibility to your students. I love this quote. Uh, Routines are the backbone of daily classroom life. They facilitate teaching and learning. Routines don't just make your life easier. They save valuable classroom time. And what's most important, an efficient routine makes it easier for students to learn and achieve more. So again, you can see lots of great benefits to having good classroom procedures. And let's see another reason why they're important, and that is that believe it or not, classroom procedures can reduce misbehaviors. Now that is a huge bonus that every teacher I know would appreciate. The simple idea that having routines in your classroom tends to not only make your students more productive, but better behaved. So teaching students procedures is a proactive approach to preventing rule violation. When we cover handling misbehaviors in this segment, um, it's coming up in a later video, we'll talk about this idea of preventative ways of handling misbehaviors. So what does research say? Remember in this chapter, I'm trying to refer back to research when we can. Good classroom management and implementing procedures. What are the outcomes? High student engagement, less misbehaviors, and maximizing instructional time. So win, win, win. All right, what happens if we don't have procedures? 
So what happens if we don't have a set routine for doing things? What's that going to look like? What's that? It's a fire alarm! Come on! You don't want this to be your class. <laughs> well, we're all glad the kindergarten class could join us. You know, you don't want that to be your class, as I said. Um, you want to make sure that you've got procedures for doing all the different things. So if you have a good procedure for lining up, you're prepared for just about anything, including fire drills. All right, so where do I start? When you're trying to come up with good classroom procedures, goodness, there are so many things to think about. Here's the essential question, though. What do I want the students to do so that I can teach and they can learn? Whew. It's an important question, but it covers a lot of different things. So I decide the easiest way to go through this is I'm going to go over 10 common classroom procedures. It's not going to be all of them. Uh, there are some that I have left out, but I try to go over ones that are important, ones that maybe you may not think of, and ones that will be truly helpful to your day, regardless of your grade level. All right. <clears throat> start of day. Why not start at the beginning? So at the very beginning of class, when students walk into your classroom, what do they need to do? So you should have a routine for students to prepare them for the start of class. Uh, now, if it's the first period, it might start with putting away their belongings, getting out what they need to be ready for the day. So that should be something that the students should know when they walk in the door. What do they need to do? <clears throat> why? Well, there are a lot of reasons why, but mainly this is going to start your day in a calm, structured way that sets the tone for the rest of the class period or the rest of the day, depending on what you're teaching. So again, it sets the tone. And this way also, when the bell rings, they're ready to go. It gives you time to prepare gives you time to welcome the students as they enter because when they come in they already know what they need to do they need to go hang up their backpack put their coat away get out their homework they can run all that routine their start of day routine and you are free to get ready for class to stand at the door and say hello so here's a question for you now depending on how you're doing your field placement if you're virtual if you're face to face or if you just want to reflect back on other classrooms you've been in have you seen a morning procedure? Is it helpful? Uh, all the ones I've seen, if they're done well, they are quite helpful. So here's some examples. The idea of when you arrive, hang up your coat and backpack, put your homework on your desk, put your lunch in your lunch basket, sharpen two pencils, start your morning work, uh, keep it when you finish, get ready for a frogtastic day. They must be the frogs. Whenever you're going through these, and especially if you're looking online to get ideas, don't just take something and say, oh, well, that must be great and go with it. Ask yourself things like, hmm, is this really complete? Is there something missing? I'll notice this one here. It doesn't say to sit in your seat. It doesn't say to stay in your seat. It doesn't say to be quiet. So make sure don't just take something from the Internet and assume that it's great. Really ask yourself about it. Uh, for younger students, you can create posters for those who, you know, maybe are pre-reading or just learning to read, use visual aids. All right, so start of day. Now, you might have noticed that many of those lists included morning work. What is morning work? Morning work can relate to this idea of a bell ringer or a sponge activity. So let's look and see what that is. Okay, for some more detail, a bell ringer or a sponge activity. It is some sort of an activity that the entire class is going to do and it prepares them for the upcoming lesson. So it could be 
the start of day. It could be that morning work when they first come in because students get into your classroom at all different times. So some might have five minutes to kill, some might only have two, but something that they're going to do at their desk until that bell rings and it's time for class to start. But this idea sponge, it could also be an activity that is during a transition time, perhaps when you're changing subjects. But again, it is something that the entire class is doing. Uh, you can use it at the start of day. You can use it prior to starting your lesson or even during a transition. So what are they? gosh, they can be so many different things. It could be review. It could be going over and grading their homework and seeing what they got wrong. It could be one of those advanced or organizers that we talked about to prepare them for the upcoming lesson. It could be, you know, some sort of project that they've been working on that that's what they spend their time on or a book that they've been reading. It could even be related to virtue or character. It could simply be fun. When my daughter was in pre-K, I remember every morning when she came in, there was something at her desk for her to do until class started. It could be a puzzle. It could be a ball of Play-Doh and a cutter. Um, it could be some sort of um, math activity for counting, but there was something there for them to do. Um, it could be an opening assignment. So for instance here, they call it bell work. And so please solve this problem and it tells them what the objective is. Um, here it gives them a reading prompt. Now, if you have it be some sort of opening assignment, it can't be an empty, empty assignment to where when the day starts, you don't ever talk about this. So if you're having them do a writing prompt, you should collect it and read it. You should talk about it. You should do something with it. Now, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, you mean I have to come up with bell ringers and sponge activities for a whole year? Not necessarily. There are great sites out there like Teachers Pay Teachers where you can pay and although $32 might sound like a lot, it's going to save you an amazing number of hours if you could simply buy a pack of bell ringers for a whole year. You can look up by grade level, by subject area. All right, our third one, <clears throat> getting students attention. We've seen over and over again the importance of this when it comes to learning. Think of information processing memory model. If your students aren't paying attention, they'll never get that information in their head in the first place. So, dun dun dun, here's your question. How can teachers do this? What do you think? Any good ideas? Well, there are a lot of things you can do. And again, this depends upon the grade and age of your students. But some fun things I've seen teachers do that clap once if you can hear me, now clap twice, hands on top, everybody stop, give me five and you explain what that means. Any sort of an attention getter that you're going to use, it should be novel and fun. Doesn't have to be fun, but it, you know, is helpful. Why not make it enjoyable? Um, I've seen some other ones. I thought this was cute. I saw this on Pinterest where the teacher would put water and something like a lavender essential oil and called it her quiet spray. And she would go around and spray it around the class and that would let the students know that's when they were to be quiet. Uh, it can be a whole class attention getter like uh, the teacher says mac and cheese and the students say everybody freeze. They can be creative. Uh, here's a video with some teachers talking about some things that have worked for them. So to get students' attention, we had a wand and we just swing it on the table and it makes a noise and the kids start to focus. Okay. In order to get class attention, I would say to the class, Cuando digo shh, los niños digan, and then in return they would say shh. And the translation of that, when I say shh, they say shh. So in my class, I would say one, two, three, eyes on me, and they would go one, two, eyes on you. In some classrooms, they have they say alligator, alligator. Yeah. These students go jump, jump. And in my classroom, when we ring the bell, or else if we were already sitting on the carpet, and I'd ask them if they could touch their head if they could hear me, or touch their ears if they could hear me, and then if everyone was touching their shoulders or ears or head, and I knew that I had a close to each other. So again, you can see there are a lot of things you can do. The only words of caution I would give for attention getters is they shouldn't be punitive, annoying, or awkward. 
all of that can lead to the bad kind of classical conditioning that make your, makes your students not like your class. So here's a common one. So rather than doing something positive to get them to be quiet, the teacher writes something on the board like stop. And if the kids are noisy, she strikes out the S. If they're still noisy, she strikes out the T. And oh, if she gets to the P, you're in trouble. That's punitive. Um, annoying, ringing a bell, or some sort of loud noise like scratching your nails on the chalkboard. I had a teacher that did that once. Very annoying, um, especially for some of your sensory kids. Or awkward. I mean, check these kids out here. So I've seen one before where the teacher would have them stand in the hallway and one hand over their lips and one hand up in the air with a finger one. Okay, that's weird. They, if you're looking around at your students and you're like, Ugh, that just looks awkward, maybe don't use that. All right, lining up. That is so much easier than it sounds. Now, I know I said I was going to stick with ones that kind of fit all age groups, and this one doesn't fit high school as much, but still, it's because lining up is hard, and lining up is important. Um, <clears throat> I love this quote. The way your line looks when you walk down the hall and the way in which students give their attention when you ask for it are measures of your classroom effectiveness. And I think this is huge. And I've seen a lot of teachers, when they see that quote, they just think, oh, oh boy, <laughs> my line looks horrible. So things to think about. You can come up with some cute things to help your students remember the procedure for lining up, whether it is um, a simple series of steps or even something like a poem or a song, one, two, listen and do, three, four, face the door. You could have spots on the floor. I love this one to give them a visual cue to know where they should stand and how they should space. Um, here's hallway poems, um, 4S in a line, silent, still, straight and smiling. Um, we're going to watch a video where you see a teacher talking with their students about lining up. Alexandria, do you want to do me a favor actually? Do you want to be my caboose? My caboose is a very important job. My caboose is the one that makes sure that she is at the end of the line, making sure that nobody gets lost between now and the time we get to class. So you need to make sure that everybody stays in line. So go ahead and take that job behind the scenes. So my first day, I, I really don't waste any time. I, I think I need to let students know that we're back to business, you know, right away. So when I needed them to stand in that line, I had to show them, you know, this is your square. You need to stand here. So I had to show them, you know, where their square was and what I meant by putting their two feet in there and that kind of thing so that they exactly knew what my expectation was. This is how you're going, going to come in every morning when we get to class. And if you're too close to her, you can always leave a little room and that's perfectly okay. And obviously this is pre-social distancing, but still. So after lining up, I want to talk about cleaning. Because again, teachers have so many things they need to do, and cleaning is one of those things where you can enlist the assistance of your students. However, do not assume that they have organization skills or cleaning skills from home. It's possible that that is something that they have never been asked to do. So you might need to show them what you mean by wiping down a desk. Um, show them what a clean desk should look like and so on. So teach it show them how to do these things because also your criteria might be different from theirs your criteria might be different from their parents so that idea of what does a clean desk look like um, that when you're talking about where their things should be for instance and perhaps where to put their trash or where to put their work uh, when it comes to desks there are a lot of teachers who have told me that that's quite a pet peeve and quite a challenge of theirs. You could come up with some creative ways to encourage students to keep their desk clean. So whether you have a desk fairy, um, <clears throat> whether you give out some sort of reinforcers for those who keep their desk clean. Um, I like this idea of the little wands from the desk fairy. Uh, also, I like this here where it talks about cleanup time, what you do, and specifies for the students things that you would have them do during this cleanup time. Uh, you also want to make sure that you have enough appropriate resources, that your cleaning materials are safe for children, and that you have plenty of it available. 
<clears throat> uh, trash is another biggie. You want to make sure that you have a procedure for not only how to put away their trash, but when. You know, that you don't want them getting up constantly throughout the day to throw things away. Maybe you have specific time periods where the trash uh, bin can be visited. So if you're thinking, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. Do I really want my students to be in charge of cleaning up their desk and keeping things straight and tidy? Check out what they're doing in some other countries. So, I mean, what a great lesson these kids are learning in not only responsibility, but also taking care of their learning space. Our next helpful procedure is pencil sharpening. Now, some of you might be thinking, pencil sharpening? Well, I gave a pre-service uh, training session to teachers about classroom management, and I gave them a little survey beforehand. and. I asked them what their biggest classroom management pet peeves were. What were their problems that I could help them with? The number one answer was pencil sharpening. Now, I was really surprised by this because I did not expect that. Um, but whether it is students coming to class without a pencil, uh, students who break their pencil in the middle of class and have to get up and use the pencil sharpener, they said it was a real nuisance. So the first thing I did was I went home um, well, I went out to the store first and I got a variety of little cans. Um, I made little signs for them. These aren't the ones that I use, but they were similar to this. Uh, with the idea, so what you do is as a teacher, you get a set of pre-sharpened pencils. You stick them in the ready-to-write can. And so if a student either forgets their pencil or breaks it during the day, rather than getting up and vroom, 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 vroom at the pencil sharpener, they can stick their used pencil in the sharpen please pick up a new one in the ready to write. Okay, that's one way of handling it. Uh, here's another one you can do if, if you want to keep track of your pencils so you don't actually lose them. But again, there are all sorts of things you might encounter. So pencil sharpening, think about how you want to handle that. Class jobs. Now let's go back to that pencil sharpening picture quick. You might have thought, oh, so then at the end of the day, you're going to have a can of all these pencils that need to be sharpened. You don't have to be the one to sharpen them have class jobs. One student, their job could be at the end of every day to sharpen all of the pencils that are in this can right here at the Sharpen Please can. So class jobs. The primary purpose of having classroom jobs is to transfer some of that responsibility to the students to help keep the classroom running smoothly. There are so many ways that you can do classroom jobs. I love these bulletin boards. So here you might have a, a handprint for all of your students. I love this with their name in it. Again, it depends on the age. And that can show who is doing what job for whatever specified time period you're working with. Um, here they have it set up like a help wanted board. And perhaps students can put their popsicle stick into the jobs that they'd like to do. And it even prescribes uh, provides a short description of that job. Uh, here are some classroom jobs that I thought were interesting because they're ones you may not usually think of, like the door opener, um, the secretary, the desk straightener, the smart board guru, the board cleaner, and so on. So what are some age appropriate jobs that you can think of that might benefit your future classroom? And again, this can be one of those great things that you can write down in a notebook to keep track of good ideas as, they, as you encounter them during, during your time here in the College of Ed. But I do highly recommend that you consider this idea of classroom jobs. 
All right, next, early finishers. What do I mean by early finishers? So this is an activity for students who get done quickly. Well, that's gonna happen all the time when you're gonna be giving them seat work. Your more advanced students or the students who happen to do well at that particular task, they're gonna get done more quickly. And then you're gonna sit there. And when students have to sit there and be bored, that's often when they misbehave. So having a procedure for early finishers can also prevent misbehavior during that time of potential boredom. So it's an activity to keep them productive. It should be something fun. It should be something kind of challenging because so if they got their work done quickly, they're ready for something more challenging. Think about it again, that idea of zone of proximal development. It should not be just boring old busy work. Students can sniff that out from a mile away. It should be relatively short because you're not certain how much time they're gonna have. Maybe they have five minutes to sit and kill, maybe it's only two. Here's some ideas, and boy, there are lots of them out there. So the idea that I'm done jar, and you can come up with all sorts of little things for them to do. Uh, you could swap out the ideas depending on the lesson or change them out each month. And so when the students are done, they can come and grab a slip and do things like, Make a list of 10 ways to be a good friend. Make a Venn diagram. Compare and contrast two of the books that you've read. <clears throat> uh, you can also go to that great site of Teachers Pay Teachers, and you can type in your grade level in your subject area, and you can find some that you can print and just use as is. <clears throat> you should have some accountability for this type of work. If it is purely an empty activity for which there's no accountability, um, students are less likely to take it seriously. That little bit of extrinsic motivation could be helpful. So whether you might have them share some of their results with the group, whether you might just collect it and put a nice sticker on it or write some kind words on it, some sort of accountability is helpful. That also does show that you find it to be meaningful and important as well. And you want to focus on something, some sort of concept or area where the students would benefit from extra, extra practice. You know, there's always those areas that you wish you had more time to cover, whether it is more time reading, more time on critical thinking skills, more time on character development. What are those areas that you wish you could spend more time on? Uh, there are some great books you can get on Amazon for critical thinking logic problems where they're just one pagers and you can get them based upon, again, different grade levels that could be used. Um, <clears throat> and again, they have them for all different grade levels. And here's some other ones that I found. So whether it's perhaps going to um, that idea of specific subjects that your students might benefit in more work, whether it is handwriting perhaps even art or creative writing. And I love this one because all students can benefit from more reading. So you could set up something like a little reading corner and when the students are done, they can go select a book, take it back to their seat or perhaps even stay at the reading corner and sit and read. Uh, and here's another one. So this teacher has little folders set up with different ideas that students can go over and pick one up and work on it. Uh, next we have transitions. Transitions are interesting. So what do I mean by transitions? This is the time between lessons. So perhaps when you're switching from um, handwriting to literature, or again, depending upon your grade level that you're teaching, you'll have different types of transitions. It could also be transitioning between whole group and small group work. So here's my advice. First of all, get your students silent before you start your transition. Okay. Cause it's only going to get louder. So start them off quiet. And that way you also have their attention. If you need to tell them what they need to do, set a time limit. Okay. You have two minutes to transition from your small group back to our whole group classroom. Uh, perhaps you can even find a two minute song or put a timer up on the screen that they can see. Let them know what kind of voice level is acceptable. <clears throat> During transitions, think about what you need them to do. 
Is this a time when they need to put away stuff that they've been working on? <clears throat> when they need to turn in things that they have completed? Do they need to clean up? Do they need to throw things away? Um, should they stay quiet? Do they need to get out materials for their next lesson? Specify all of that. Perhaps even write it down somewhere. And then finally, last but not least, we have end of day. So, do you really want to teach, 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 and then the bell rings and they run out the door? Aren't there some beneficial things they could do before that bell rings and they run out the door? Think about your dismissal procedures. So, uh, what do they need to do about their backpacks to get ready to go? Uh, could this be a time that they clean up their areas? What about chairs? It might be possible that on Fridays you have to have all the stair chairs stacked or put up on the desk for cleaning. You know, your students can do that for you. Um, so think about, again, what is it you want your students to do before they go? And a great idea is also for them to double check that they have what they need for homework and they know what their homework is. Uh, and here you can see some different types of end of day routines that teachers have come up with. And I love to hear that the teacher has even specified between what the whole class is doing and what individual students need to be doing. All right, so now our final topic is teaching procedures. So check out this meme first. You'll notice it says when you spend the first two weeks on teaching classroom procedures and now it's week four and they're completing them on their own. Procedures can be a way to get your class to run almost on automatic pilot, but only if you put the time in to teach it. Some teachers believe that we only teach the routines and procedures once and the kids are going to get it. We need to take the time to teach them now. And yes, it will take time, but it saves me time in the long run. If I can get them to learn those routines and procedures now, I'm not going to be spending such a long time to reteach. So if I can get it down now, later on, it's just a very quick reminder and I can just get them back into shape. So in the long run, it is saving me time. I like this quote, procedures are supposed to be a time saver, but if not taught well, you'll find yourself wasting time with reminders and constantly repeating yourself. Um, <clears throat> So again, I had to include these memes. Can I go to the bathroom? I don't know. Can you um, enter the classroom quietly and walking, not running? You're going to be constantly reminding students because that just shows you that you haven't taught them what they need to do. So some general advice when it comes to teaching procedures. First of all, they need to know what your expectations are. What is it you want them to do? What does it mean to have a clean desk? What does it mean to stand in a straight line? And they should know why. Knowing why can be helpful. Make sure your expectations are also age appropriate. Model. Model, remember from social cognitive theory, means to demonstrate. You, first of all, you as the teacher demonstrate, then have a student demonstrate, and then perhaps a whole group of students demonstrate. Routines and procedures are, are crucial. Um, basically the way that I do it for me, and I know it works differently for everybody, but for me it's I take whatever it is that I expect for them and I have to make sure that I model everything. So there's, I model it, we practice, we recorrect or pre-correct and then model again and continue to practice. Um, so there's routines and procedures for everything, even for the most minute thing. I can't assume that students already know how to do it's very easy. So again, that idea of modeling can be very helpful because what you are teaching them is a skill and that's when modeling works best. Practice. You're going to have them practice over and over again, things like lining up so they can get it down because again, it needs to become a routine and use what we call reinforcement narration. Reinforcement narration means that while they're modeling and practicing it, tell them what they're doing right. Yes, you're going to want to correct what's wrong too, but if you just focus on don't do this and don't do that, it's not very helpful. They need to hear what they should be doing and reinforcing that when they do it correctly. So instead of saying what not to do, focus on telling them what they should be doing. And that's just good general rule of thumb. 
helpful sometimes to want to call out the things that you're seeing that students are not doing. But you have to remember that students will model from the positives. And it's very obvious as soon as I say, oh, I really like the way that so-and-so is sitting up straight. You see all the little bodies, you know, straighten up. Positives work, and I've noticed that they work better than the negatives, but I try to remind myself I need to keep it positive so that everybody follows what I want to see, and I don't want them to copy what I don't want them to see. Or prop. Very good way of stating that. So, then revise if needed. You might find part way through that, you know what, my bathroom procedure just is not working. Or this lining up thing, I've got to rethink it. That's part of way back at the beginning of chapter one, effective teaching strategies. Be flexible. Be willing to uh, recognize when sometimes you make a mistake and need to do things differently. All right, that is it for procedures. I know this video was a little bit longer. Thanks for hanging in there with me, and I'll see you next time.